So we are up to chapter one, Mishnah five, and I'll read the Mishnah quickly, and then we'll break it down like we always do. Yosi ben Yochanan ish Yerushalayim Omer. Yosi ben Yochanan, the man of Jerusalem, says, Yihi beis chapasuch l'ervacha, let your house be open wide. V'yihiyu ani im b'nei beisach, let the poor be members of your household. V'al tarbe sicha im ha'isha, and do not have excessive conversation with a woman. Be'ishto amru, this was even said about one's own wife, Kal v'chomer, all the more so, be'eshes chavero, all the more so in the wife, with respect to the wife of your fellow. Mikan amru, based upon this, the, the sages said, Kal amar b'sicha ima'isha, whoever has excessive conversation with a woman, goreim ra'a la'atzmo, he causes evil to himself, ubo temodivri Torah, and he neglects the study of Torah, v'sofo yoresh gehenem, and in the end, he will inherit gehenem. It's a very a lot of moving parts in this Mishnah. It begins by talking about having to open home, welcoming the poor people into your house, and then it starts talking about conversations with women, and it goes off on a tangent of that, even with your own wife. Don't have excessive conversation, certainly not with the wife of your fellow. And then it says what happens if you do. What happens if you have conversations with other women? It's going to go really bad. That's the Mishnah. So there's a lot to unpack here. So let's try, let's try to figure out what's going on over here. So if you remember, we had a second Mishnah of this chapter of this book that told us that the world stands on three pillars. Pillar number one is Torah. Pillar number two is Avoda, is worship of God. And pillar number three is Chesed, kindness. And then the three successive Mishnahs were teaching us, breaking down uh, each one of these three pillars individually. So first we had Antignos, who told us what's the proper relationship we're supposed to have with God. Last week, on last Mishnah, we talked about Torah. How do we maximize Torah? We have to study from teachers. We have to sit by the dust of the feet. And here we're told how to have kindness, how to have amazing interpersonal relationships, and how to do it in a safe and a righteous way. But of course, there's always have to understand what do these things mean individually, and what's the connection between the two. We start talking about have an open home, welcome the poor people into your home. Okay, don't talk too much with women. It seems very. It seems like it's a totally different realm. And then once it talks about not having conversations with women or excessive conversation with women, it says, well, even if with your own wife. And what does that mean? You shouldn't be talking with your own wife. That we're supposed to, you know, what relationship is based upon communication. And like, what does this mean? Uh, and then it says a very severe list of things that happen when someone talks excessively with other women. It says that bad things happen to them and they stop studying Torah and they go to Gehenna. It seems like it's kind of very severe. So what, what's going on over here? So let's, be, let's begin at the beginning and then move our way progressively. So the first instruction was to have an open home. Yehi beischa pasuach lirvacha. Now the word lirvacha is a little bit of a problematic word because it can mean multiple things. It could mean open wide, but lirvacha also means profit, to profit. Not as in a prophet, as in Moses, but as in uh, to make money, to have profit, materialistic profit. So the various commentaries, they go on two different uh, parallel uh, paths to understand what this instruction may have an open home or have an open home that will result in profit. So what's going on over here? So I think the first way to understand this instruction is that when we think of, of how we help those that are less fortunate than us, how we do kindness, how we do charity with other people. So a lot of people say, you know, that that's not my, that's not my problem. Someone else's situation, you know, they made poor choices, it's on them. That's, of course, not the Torah's attitude. The Torah's attitude is one of kindness, of charity. But even within kindness and charity, there's two attitudes that you could have. There's the attitude of, let me, this is a cost. This is a tax on being a good Jew. There's a tax. You got to pay 10% of your money to charity. You got to tithe. You see someone who needs something, got to help. And it's something that's a tax. But here we're told that don't treat the relationship that you have with those that you're trying to help as a tax. Rather, you should welcome them into your home. And you should make these Poor people, they, they should become household members. What that means is that it's more than just something that you have to pay for, but it's a demanding us that we should welcome 
and embrace those that are less fortunate into our home. So that's the, yes, yes. Have a develop an emotional connection with them. That's the simple understanding. Additionally, uh, one of the commentaries points out that the word lervacha could mean to profit, to benefit materially. And what this means is, is that whenever someone tries to do good to others, especially those that are not part of their immediate family, strangers, then right away the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination, says, wait a minute, you don't make enough money to pay for your own kids' summer camp and to pay for your own community and to, you know, you don't always have the most delicious meals because you can't necessarily afford it. And now you're going to bring some stranger into your own home and feed them? That's what the Yetzir Hara tells, tells a person. Whether it's true or not, that, that that is a feeling that we get when we want to help someone who we don't know. Well, here we're told, Yihi beischa pasuach lirvacha. You let your home be open to profit. What this is, what this means, is that the Torah is telling us that the attitude is that when you help someone else who is less fortunate, God will help you to make you rich, to make you wealthy. The Talmud tells us that. When there's a poor person and there's a rich person and the rich person helps the poor person, yes, the rich person is helping the poor person, says the Talmud. But the poor person is helping the rich person more than the rich person is helping the poor person. And the reason is, is because God is a trillionaire. He has more money than anyone else in existence. And he decides how to dispense and allocate those funds. And when he sees people that are benevolent and are giving to those that are less fortunate than them, then he decides to allocate wealth to them. The Talmud tells us, Aser bishvil shetit asher. Tithe, give 10% of money to charity in order that you become wealthy. Furthermore, says the Talmud, that when someone, generally someone is not allowed to test God. You can say, oh, if God really exists, let him strike me down with lightning. We, we don't do that. But there's one area in life that someone's allowed to actually make test for God, and that is with regards to charity. And even though there's a verse that says not to test God, this is the exception, that you're allowed to test God in this, in this area. And there's an amazing, uh, striking, dramatic uh, verse in the book of Hosea in, in Scripture that describes charity compares it to planting. It talks about chesed, kindness, and charity, and it compares it to planting and harvesting. Because when someone plants, what do you do? You take seeds and you throw them into the ground. You bury them. And if someone was just a innocent bystander, someone's just uninitiated, they see someone taking really valuable produce and throwing it into the ground and burying it and just wasting. And you dig it up from the ground and it starts rotting. Why? It's it's just a, such a waste. You're taking things that you could use to eat. You're taking wheat that's perfectly fine. You could grind to make flour, make bread. And you're throwing it into the dirt, into the, into, into the mud. You're wasting. You're just throwing it out. But you don't realize, the uninitiated doesn't realize, that by dropping in a few seeds into the ground, yes, maybe initially you're losing or you think you're losing or the uninitiated thinks you're losing, but we know what's actually going to happen is this is going to yield much, much, much more of what you threw into the ground. While it may seem that you're throwing things away, actually what you're doing is investing for the future. And says the verse, when you are giving charity, you're planting. And when you're doing kindness, you're harvesting. What this means is that when you're giving away without any tangible return, you're actually investing spiritually that will yield in many, many multiples of what you're investing. I think it's a very powerful lesson to look at that we can find from our Mishnah, that when you're, and, and it's a way to overcome the problem. You know, we're told that there's three pillars that uphold the world. And one of them is kindness. And kindness, of course, means it's a general category for doing good with other people. And we don't immediately in our monkey brain, so to speak, we don't immediately see the connection between 
doing good and how we immediate, how, how do we benefit from this? It seems like every rational person should make a cost benefit analysis of throwing away money to something that will not yield you anything. It seems like it's a bad idea. Yet we're told here is that no, you do this and it'll be l'ravacha. You'll actually profit of, you'll actually benefit, which is a very powerful motivator to, for us to embrace this way of thinking, this way of life. So that's the beginning. Open up your house, l'ravacha, for kindness and for profit. What does the next part of the Mishnah says? The next part of the Mishnah says, and let the poor people be members of your household. So Rashi tells us that this is the highest level of charity. The highest level of charity is where you don't give the other person a free handout. You hire them and they work for you. And that is a way to allow them to, to, to earn an income without shame, with dignity, where they're able to work for a living. You give someone a job, a job even though they have to work, that actually allows them to, to survive with dignity. Let the poor people be members of your household. Give them a job in your business, in your household, in your life, in your world. Let them be there. Not, not just someone who gets a handout. You come, get a handout, and you leave. They're part of your household because they work for you. That's what Rashi says. Uh, alternatively, what this means is that when you have guests, you invite guests to your home, treat them like they're members of your household. So when you have a, when your 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 child doesn't want to eat, you want to force feed them, right? You want to say, "Come on, finish your food." Uh, but the when the neighbor comes or the poor person comes, you say, "Like I don't want to fill up their plate too much. I'm just feeding someone, and he's leaving. How do I benefit from this?" Right? That's an attitude that we could have. And here we're told, "Be as generous to the poor people as you are with your children. Feed them generously, and just like your children. What happens when a child comes home from school? How was your day?" Right. Who did you play with? What do you do today? How are you feeling? How are things? You inquire. The relationship the parent has with the child is one of deep emotional connection. It's not just like, let me give you a handout, let me give you lunch, and you're on your own. It's a relationship. So too, when you have poor people or guests that come to you, inquire about their well-being, engage with them, talk to them, empathize with them. And the Talmud tells us actually that when someone gives charity, there's six blessings from God that they get. When someone appeases the poor person, when someone emotionally engages with them, they get 11 blessings. It's a much higher level of kindness and charity to not just give a handout, but to make them feel like they're a household member. So we see here that there's also an element of an emotional bond that you should develop with your guests and with poor people. And then what's the last part of this, Mishnah? But don't have excessive conversation with women. So suppose someone has guests, and there's a husband and wife staying by them, and they're poor people, and you're feeding them, and you're trying to do what's, what's required of you. So you give them food, you try to find them a job, and you talk to them, and you appease them, and you engage with them on an emotional level. Says the Torah, says the Mishnah here, don't have excessive conversations with the woman. What that means is that if you're fraternizing or frolicking too much with someone else's wife, and you think, well, I'm doing a mitzvah. Because I, the, the rabbi said that you're supposed to do kindness and charity on an emotional level too. And you're supposed to ask about how they're doing and try to connect to them and appease them and, and empathize with them. That could be very dangerous if you're doing it with someone else's wife. Because that may lead to sin, which is not the intention of the Torah. Th- thus, it doesn't say don't talk at all to the woman. Don't talk excessively. You hear. What the, what, the, what the mission is warning us is that there is an ideal here that we're trying to strive, but it does have within it an inherent danger as well. If someone has this attitude and he has too much excessive conversation with women who are in the guests of his home, that may lead to uh, infidelity, and that's a big problem. 
So according to according to this understanding, the mission actually has a continuity, but it's all about the proper relationship you're supposed to have with your guests. Make your open up your home wide, invite the poor people in, take care of them on various levels. However, be careful not to develop too much of a chummy chummy relationship with women because that might have problems. There could be a certain chemistry and electricity in in the, in the conversation, too much sex in conversation with the woman that could have a uh, a different dimension to it and cause problems down the line. Down, down the line. And it's interesting if you actually look at the framework of the Mishnah. The Mishnah doesn't talk about actually feeding poor people or giving them charity. It's talking about kind of what's the what's the setting in which charity and kindness thrives. Have an open home. It doesn't say it doesn't say like feed people. It's talking about kind of the, the the preparation. How do you prepare yourself? Make your home one where kindness and charity flourishes. People should be comfortable there. Poor people should be always there, household members. So it's interesting, like the beginning of the Mishnah, open up your door wide, do whatever you can to set up the situation so that charity can flourish. And the end is an encouragement to avoid, again, the situation that may lead to sin. Right? There's nothing inherently wrong with excessive conversation with a woman. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, however, what that is, that could be the first step that could eventually result in a sin and infidelity down the line. And that's what it's telling you is prepare the situation, be cognizant of the situation that's going to lead to to mitzvos and encourage that and be wary and avoid situations that may cause sin and avoid that. I, I think that, you know, our, what's happening today in the news with all these people being outed as uh, 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 for horrible behavior, I think it's it's I think this is a very important dose of of sobriety, so to speak, where it's telling you to stop a harmful relationship before it gets out of hand. It doesn't say you know don't commit a, a infidelity. That's understood. But what it's telling you is that there is a slippery slope that's going to lead to such behavior that may already start. By just having excessive conversation, conversation, you know, I think there are many laws in 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 halacha that are not tr- about stopping the sin, so to speak, when it's about to happen, but stopping it way, way, way before. Like, for example, there is a law called yichud, which is a Torahitic prohibition against having seclusion with a member of the other sex, and this is again not it, it's not talking about when if something actually happens it says the actual seclusion itself even if nothing nothing happens that in itself is a sin according to the torah what that means is if you have a babysitter or help or whatever uh where two people are secluded together and there's no one else around that in itself is already infringing on torah law even if nothing actually happens during that time why again this is stopping you before you even get to a situation where sin could happen. There was a, a little brouhaha a couple of months back about the vice president, Mike Pence, where this big scandal because he didn't want to have – he didn't have lunch with women staffers unless his wife was there. And then I was like, oh, you know, he's hurting women's chances for advancement. All these – it was politicized, of course. And regardless of your politics, I think especially in light of all these revelations – of all these powerful men and what they do to to their underlings, it's it's really I think evident. It should be evident to all that this is just a, a healthy and uh, forward thinking protection. And we see in the Torah, the Torah is telling us it's not just about don't sin in very egregious ways. Prepare yourself to be someone who is going to not even come into situations where this could even get out of hand. Uh, as long as, I'm going to say the statement, you can agree with it or not, but as long as the rules of nature apply, men and women will never just be colleagues. It's not going to happen. Uh, and thus, the Torah is preparing us for that by telling us, don't have excessive conversation with women. And then it elaborates. It says, Be'ishto amru, even with respect to one's own wife. And the obvious question is, wait a minute, your own wife, you know, that's, that sounds like fair game. 
and that maybe she would even even be encouraged. So why are we? Why is the Torah? Why is the Mishnah discouraging excessive conversation between husband and wife? So various interpretations in the sages. I found at least four. I'm sure there's more. I didn't even look. I didn't even look, and I found four. So first of all, according to some, this is only when a woman is a nida. A nida means a woman that by halachic standards, uh, they cannot be intimate because she's menstruating. And therefore, excessive conversation, excessive frivolity that may lead somewhere down the line to sin, that should be avoided during this time. Again, along the same lines, to prevent something from getting out of hand, don't allow it to nip it in the bud. And therefore, during only – so according to some, what this mission is saying, even with your own wife, there are situations where you would avoid it as a conversation, certainly not with other people's wives. Uh, that's one uh, – one, that's one explanation given. I saw another one that says that this doesn't mean you shouldn't have deep, meaningful conversations with your spouse. Of course not. What this means is that if people are just always chattering with each other, it's just always schmoozing invariably it's going to lead to disagreements and it's going to lead to unnecessary scuffles. And what that means is that if people, you know, you know, people who work from home, it's great, right? But if both husband and wife are working from home and they're just always bumping into each other at all times and they just don't see anyone else and just their spouse, it actually is, could be a recipe for marital disunity. Uh, and therefore, again, we're saying the idea of not having excessive conversation can even apply in certain situations to uh, their wife. Other interpretations are given as well as, well as to various uh, points of time where excessive conversation with your own wife is could be problematic. And then the Mishnah doubles down and it says that if someone has excessive conversation with other people's wives or with other women, there's three different and progressively worsening consequences of that. So first of all, it says, Gorem ra'ala atzmo. It causes evil to himself. So it's also clear what this evil is. But I, I, I want to suggest an approach that what this Mishnah is describing, what this end of the Mishnah is describing, is how the progression of the ultimate sin is going to happen. Again, we said, the mission is stopping us before it gets out of hand. Don't have a sense of conversation. Don't allow the situation to be such that conditions could be ripe for an eventual sin. But what the mission is now doing is it's spelling it out how it's going to evolve. First of all, it's going to go rem ra'ala atzmo. So what's going to happen? Someone's going to have a sense of conversation with a woman who's not his wife. And there's going to be a certain connection or a certain chemistry between the two. And that's going to cause evil to him. What does that mean? It's going to cause evil to him. It's going to cause frustration. It's going to – he's unnecessarily teasing himself. What this means is, is that you're opening up the door, Pandora's box, if you will, for a connection that by the designs of God in nature, when a man and a woman – they're attracted to each other and they have a an emotional bond over a excessive conversation, that's going to create a certain tension uh, where certainly the man is going to now be tempted to act in a certain way. And suppose at the beginning he's going to stop himself. I'm morally upstanding. I'm not going to do it. But he's causing unnecessary frustration for himself. He's teasing himself. It's causing bad to him. That's the first step. And then it's going to occupy his mind in a way that he's not going to be able to concentrate on other things. And what is the next thing? It says, Ubotel midivri Torah. He's going to neglect to study Torah. He's going to try to study Torah. And because there's something bouncing around in his head and his uh, hormones are firing on all cylinders, it's very hard for him to concentrate on other things. Certainly Torah, which really demands... Torah demands full concentration. You have to really harness your entire intellectual faculties to do it properly. So you're going to need to have be all on board and you have all these fantasies in your head that are swirling 
that are disrupting because of what started earlier. Eventually, someone who begins this process of excessive conversation and then we'll have the frustration, and then we'll be able to think about other things, eventually will lead to sin in one form or the other, and thus will result in Gehenim. Thus he'll have to have to purge himself from sin, because once sin cleaves to a person, they have to address it in one way or the other. So again, the bottom line of the Mishnah is, or the last part of the Mishnah is, that even though initially the relationship was just excessive schmoozing, talking, not actually sinning, the Mishnah is prognosticating where this will eventually bring you to. And I think, it's again, like we said, it's a very valuable lesson at a time where we see such moral degeneracy being exposed every day. People maybe who are initially considered morally upstanding, but then the truth comes out and we find people behaving in really bad ways. Here we see a way to avoid it before it gets out of control because there is a process. Excessive schmoozing, Excessive relationship, even, and this is this is a process for someone who wants to avoid the sin. It's interesting. It's not someone who's trying to embrace his sin. He's someone who's trying to avoid this the, this the, the behavior uh, that is re, uh, repugnant. They want to avoid the behavior, but they say, "Well, it's just smoothing. It's not a big deal." Of course, if someone doesn't want to avoid it, then maybe the mission is not talking to them. But people who don't want to follow the ways of the morally corrupt, they may argue it's just. I'm not doing anything. It's a platonic relationship. You know, we're, we're just having a good time. We're just going out for drinks or whatever. Nothing's going to happen. What it's telling us is that something will happen because that's, that's just the nature of the beast. It doesn't automatically jump to the end. It starts with developing an emotional relationship and then it's frustrating and then it's, you're, you're causing bad to yourself because you're not executing what you really want to do and now you have that little thing niggling within you and it's going to disrupt your thought, you want to study Torah, and eventually it will bring you to a sin or another. A very powerful lesson of how to have kindness for the Mishnah. How to have a good relationship with other people, but also to do it in a safe way that you don't actually follow the path of sin. Very important lesson. And next week we'll do the following Mishnah.